Lord, we come into your word humble, for we know not all of its truth, nor do we have the fullness of understanding. And even as we reflect upon it now, Lord, we wait for the awakening your spirit will give us under truth and the revelation that comes only when we read this word with you. To your glory and praise, may each word that is spoken, each truth that is understood, be unto you, O Lord. Amen. There's a number of reasons that people often seem to be waiting until later in life to grow in their faith, to deepen their faith, to engage in a spiritual life. For many people, it's simply that once with the business of education, of companion finding, of building and raising family, of home stabilizing, of employment, career, vocation, securing, once the business of all the rest of that is living is sorted out, well, then maybe there'll be some time for religious matters. And the problem with that thinking, and there's a lot of problems, but the core problem, the underlying problem with that thinking is that a lifetime of living faith informs education, vocation, family life and marriage, and brings purpose and unity to all of it and to all the rest that is life. A life without faith is a wandering mess of mischances and of simply trying to look back over life, look for God rather than walking with God. God, where were you in my life as I walked through all this? Rather than, Lord, I know you were always there. Walk with me still. It's a rough awakening for many who do come later in life to faith. Not just for those who take hard paths through life, but those who have taken and had easy paths through life, but have taken faith in the presence of God for granted. Even a life within the fellowship of a church may not be a life of faith in God, but a faith in practice, a routine, something they have always done, have always sought to do, but the meaning of it and the purpose of it was not explored until these other things of life were looked after. Jesus tells the story of a farmer who's looking out over his field, this wonderful parable, watching the shoots come up. That takes us back to the children's story from last week. Watching, the, maybe hearing the shoots come up. As the field is growing, he, he sees and his servants see that it's not just the wheat that was planted that's growing in the field. I have a weed in my garden. I want to tell you about it. We've planted tomatoes, we've planted peas, some beans, uh, some carrots, a few radishes, a whole lot of cucumbers, and a couple of pumpkins, a couple of pumpkin plants. However, I did not plant any potatoes. I thought about it, but never got around to it. So it was a colossal surprise to me when right in the middle of my cucumber vines is a massive potato plant. Goes to show that when you use homemade compost, make sure it's fully composted. What is most shocking though, and I have grown potatoes before, is that this particular potato plant has no bugs on it. I don't know if that has something to do with growing among cucumbers, I'm waiting for the biologists and the botanists to get back to me. But for now, there's no bugs on my potato plant. It's growing well, and the cucumbers are fine. It's probably the most successful potato plant I've ever grown. Only I never intended on growing it. It is, for all intents and purposes, a weed in the garden. And so I look at the parable that Jesus offers us in the Gospel of Matthew today. I look at it in a couple of ways. The servants are very quick to pick up on, there's things that we didn't plant here, sir. Master, what are we supposed to do with these plants that we didn't plant, that shouldn't be here, that aren't part of the group? What do we do with them? And the master says, leave them. Leave them. If I get rid of them, you're probably going to dig up the wheat that's out there as well, and you're going to trample it, and who knows what else. 
If I get rid of the potato, I risk losing some very healthy cucumber plants, as well as the carrots aren't far away from this. Maybe I'll disturb their early growth. And you know when you mess with carrots, they don't come back very easily. They get dried out. So, and I may discover that I want a few new potatoes sometime later in August anyway. I was reminded recently of just how healthy those little lamb quarters leaves are. They, they grow up all through our gardens around here. But it's a healthy addition to any salad, so while I'm pulling them up as weeds, I'm getting rid of something that could be fruitful. In some gardens as well, what grows alongside of, even in, in large crops, what grows along, uh, alongside of these plants can be very good for plants. I grow borage along with my tomatoes. Why? Because it, is, it helps bring out better nutrients for the tomatoes. So let the weeds grow with the wheat, Jesus says, the master says. And come harvest, we'll make the decision about what to do with them. And that which is really a weed that serves no purpose, that was an annoyance, that made it hard for the wheat to grow, those weeds, they're in the fire. Burned as chaff, I'm going to turn mine to dirt into, into lawn mulch. And that which is the really good fruit will be a joy at heart including maybe a few potatoes. But it's going to take patience. So there's all those servants. And you can just imagine all those farmhands that are eager to do the work that needs to get done. I don't know how many farmhands you've encountered with life, but a lazy farmhand isn't a farmhand for long. But those good farmhands that are, what can we what cattle can we move today? What hay can we bring down today? What barn door needs to be repaired? What, what garden needs to be weeded? Those are the farmhands we look for. And these are eager farmhands that are in this parable. And they want to get right out there and deal with those tears right now so that they're not going to be a problem at harvest. But they are told to wait. And the patience of waiting is something our society struggles with, and I pray it will continue to struggle with it until it gets the lesson of patience. The sitting on a situation, the contemplation, the meditation, it doesn't yield instant results. But often it, re, it, re, it results in better understanding, in insight, and in wiser directions being taken. We're going to have a year with more reflection and meditation and time to take the time to be patient with ideas and to work them through and not rush them through. Not try them on the run but to really think out the long-term consequences of the decisions we are making and we have made. To take a careful look back over all the things that we've been doing as a people, as society, as a church, and ask the questions to actually recognize where we've stumbled and what we've had to learn. Jacob was in a stumbling place. On our Old Testament reading, Jacob's on the run. Why is he on the run? Last straw with his brother Esau. He'd finally gone too far. It's just beyond embarrassment. But he had taken the inheritance, the final blessing, the great blessing of his father. Taken that away from Esau, something that cannot be taken back or traded over, a blessing that belongs only to the one who it's given, and though Isaac intended it for Jacob, intended it for Esau, it is Jacob who receives it. And in his fury, Esau is ready to rip his brother limb from limb. He's ready to kill him. And Jacob was on the run and found himself in a place of stumbling stones. And he makes those stones into a pillow and he rests on them in that barren place. And it's a barren place to him. He can't see what it really is. But Jacob is made to see. 
Jacob, in his dream, awakens to see the truth about that place. God opens his eyes into revelation to recognize that from where Jacob is in his life, in that barren place, in that place of brokenness, in that place of desolation, in that place of desperate hope, that is where God is doing things in Jacob's life and in the life of all humanity. And Jacob has made witness to the colossal vision of the open gates of heaven and those climbing up and coming down out of heaven upon that ladder. Jacob awakens to a realization about the will of God at the very gateway of the kingdom of heaven to recognize that God is moving in his life and in the life of those around him and there is still hope, there is possibilities and he has a place, not just any place, but God reveals to him that his children, Jacob's children, will have that gateway to heaven as their home. The doors of the kingdom of heaven are his home and the home of his children and his children's children and to uncounted generations until those of his line are like the dust on the earth. Imagine waking up to that promise and that responsibility. That same realization is what Jesus was teaching, what John preached, that the kingdom of heaven is coming and is right here right here in the midst of your life. Wheat or tares, we don't know what we are, but that we are being grown towards a day of harvest, that there comes a time when fruitfulness is assessed and the tares will be found wanting. We are to be as wheat, but not just wheat. Wheat that grows, but wheat that is fruitful, wheat that tends the field around it, not to call on one another to call each other names, to say you're the tares and you're the weeds, but to nurture one another in our growth together. A lone tree in a field struggles to stand. It must dig its roots deep. It must bend itself and be flexible, but strong in the winds and in the seasons. A lone tree is a rare thing and must be hardy and deeply rooted to survive. But most trees do very well when they're gathered together and protect one another in each of the seasons, in the heat of the west and of the south winds, or in the cold frost of the north. None of these overwhelm, but together as a forest, the trees survive and thrive. Awaken to see how with one another and in one another's lives and in the relationship that we maintain in the fellowship of faith that we together stand before the open gateway unto heaven. That God has opened unto you in Christ to recognize your place in that kingdom. For in Christ you are made heirs of God's kingdom and in your faith you are distinguished as such to others that we may guide and encourage one another. Better still, you are made whole in that we are joint heirs in Christ. If that we suffer with him, that we also be glorified together. It is difficult. It is difficult to accept. It is harder still to recognize that this presence and this grace has been around us and offered to us our whole lives. And so often, we have not even looked for it. We have suffered and caused suffering. We have hurt when we should have healed. We have been hurtful, given hurtful words instead of good news. Oh, what wonder is the love of God for, hear Paul again, and the assurance to the church and to us, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared the glory that shall be revealed in us. I thought he was going to say in Christ. But it's because Christ is in us that the glory is revealed in us as well. What an honor. God's glory is being revealed in you. Don't hide that. 
Don't you dare hide that in any kind of false saying. Do not diminish the gifts of the Spirit within you. Lift praise as more than song, but as life and grace and peace given in everything you do in your life, in every moment of that life, in every precious God-given moment of life, awaken to the recognition of the presence of God in your life. From conception to the eternity, we will celebrate together. For not even the grave can stifle the love of Christ in us. All to God's glory and praise. Amen.